really ser serious uh, wildfires here in Colorado. Um, not as many now as you have in California and Oregon. So they've now eclipsed us, but we've been having problems since May. And uh, it's bad. My mom has COPD and is an oxygen. So it's been quite a, quite a challenge. Well, my computer clock says it's one o'clock. I'm going to start the recording. Hi, Elena. How are you? And resume. Hi, everybody. My name is Cassie Sofing, and on behalf of all the presenters, I'd like to welcome you to Globe Student Investigations with NASA. This is our first webinar collaboratively where we'll have a chance to share with you a broad range of Earth system science research opportunities to connect students to exploring and analyzing data. It's our hope that you will encourage your students to enter their research in the GLOBE International Virtual Science Symposium. Our presenters today are from the GLOBE Implementation Office, the NASA Earth Science Education Collaborative, GLOBE Mission Earth, Arctic and the Earth Science, and My NASA Data. Their presentations have been pre-recorded. However, during each presentation, the presenters will be online with their video and eager to answer your questions. Please use the chat option and send to panelists and to everybody. We're so excited that you've joined us today. Thank you. everyone, my name is Julie Malmberg. I want to tell you about the 2021 Globe International Virtual Science Symposium. I work with a great team of people and they are pictured here. We have Amy Barfield, Emma Hagen, then me, and then Sarah Parsons. And we're all part of the GAO education team. I also wanted to point out on this website that or on this slide that we have a website you can refer to it is globe.gov slash science dash symposium. Or if you have questions, you can email us at globeivss at ucar.edu. So first, what is the Science Symposium? The Science Symposium is an online space for students to share and discuss their research with other students, Happy. scientists, We're and professionals, and video. the global community. It is open to from kindergarten through undergrad for about ages five to about 22. And we also have rubrics by grade level. And this year is our eighth. Was I sensing that it wasn't sharing? Yeah, we were hearing it, but we weren't actually seeing Julie's video. It was still the PowerPoint. Wow. And I'm not sure you saw that in the chat. So I thought I'd interrupt. I'm so glad you did. And now I have an actual recording of a goof up. So that's not a good thing. So hold on just a moment. Technical issues are, I think, inevitable. <laughs> well, it's not like I didn't practice several times, trust me. but. We'll try again. A black screen? Yeah. OK. This looks promising. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Julie Malmberg. I want to tell you about the 2021 Globe International Virtual Science Symposium. I work with a great team of people, and they are pictured here. We have Amy Barfield, Emma Hagen, then me, and then Sarah Parsons. And we're all part of the GAO education team. I also wanted to point out on this website that or on this slide that we have a website you can refer to it is globe.gov slash science dash symposium. Or if you have questions, you can email us at globeivss at ucar.edu. So first, what is the science symposium? The science symposium is an online space for students to share and discuss their research with other students, scientists and STEM professionals, and the GLOBE community. It is open to all GLOBE students from kindergarten through undergrad for about ages five to about 22. And we also have rubrics by grade level. And this year is our eighth year of doing this. I wanted to share with you some important dates. First off, we have an informational webinar, October 7th. And that webinar will go into a lot more detail about the IVSS and what's been needed for this year. 
Then on October 14th, we're going to have a Globe Data Science intro and a Q&A time. And then on October 28th, we're going to have a webinar about mapping your Globe data with Esri ArcGIS. All of these webinars will be recorded and available on our website after they take place. Reports will be accepted from January until March 10th, 2021. Again, the due date is March 10th. And we will have a judging webinar on March 29th. Then from March 29th through April 5th, is our judging period. Then finally on April 22nd or Earth Day, we'll have a live drawing for stipends and then also provide feedback and the badges that are earned. So how do you enter? Each entry must include a research report, globe data, this, these data can be new or archived, a narrative on our additional badges, a presentation of some sort, it can be a poster or a narrative PowerPoint or a story map or a video link. We encourage creativity and also photo releases. And again, this will be provided a lot more information on our website and also our webinar October 7th. And when you're ready to enter a project, you can actually upload a research report on our website. So again, if you go to globe.gov slash science dash symposium, you'll see this blue button there when it's ready. And when you actually upload a research report, make sure that you've selected the International Virtual Science Symposium report and then follow through optional things requested. This will be explained more at a webinar on October 7th. And also we will be able to help you if you have any questions. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Amy Barfield. Hey, so why do the IVSS? So in addition to having a great experience for students to work on developing science skills and writing reports and interacting with international scientists, all students will earn a student researcher virtual badge. They'll be posted on their school web pages. So there will be a scoring period where judges will score the projects and will assign a score between zero to four stars on the reports. And we're not looking to limit the number of top scoring reports. Actually, the more the merrier. Um, so all students will receive this virtual badge and a score. But students are also encouraged to um, get additional badges. And so these are badges that demonstrate science skills. So that includes make an impact, which includes like community impacts, um, effects on the community and stuff like that. Be a STEM professional be a STEM storyteller, be a collaborator, be a data scientist, or be an engineer. And you'll want to describe how you've earned those badges in your report. So all the students who've earned a four stars and have at least earned at least two of those additional badges will be entered into a drawing on April 22nd, so Earth Day. And those projects will be randomly selected and the winner will win a stipend and will also be invited to the 2021 Globe Annual Meeting Student Experience. So now I just wanna show you our webpage. So this is the landing page you'll see when you go to globe.gov slash science dash symposium. And if you can see, on the left, there's a bar that has additional child pages. So we have instructions about how to enter, um, information about the rubrics and badges, resources, including poster and report templates, frequently asked questions, and then um, information about judging. And so we're always looking for judges. And so if hopefully you are interested in judging or know someone who might be interested in judging. And if you go to that page, the volunteer judge page, you'll see this form. And that's all we ask you to fill out. And I'll have your email address, your name, your location, um, and what language you speak and how many projects you're interested in scoring. We've got a couple of new things this year. So first of all, we're gonna be focusing on data science. Um, and this is so that we can encourage students to use both new data, if that's okay, um, they're following local rules and guidelines during the pandemic, but also just to explore data science as a science skill, it's a great topic. And to help with this, we've got a couple of additional webinars that Julie had mentioned earlier. And so that includes data science, uh, intro data science, and mapping with ArcGIS. We've also updated our rubrics for each grade level this year. 
And last year we created a, a resource for judges to provide tips for student feedback, feedback. And this includes ways to give constructive feedback that'll really help the students improve in the next year or years to come. We also have a student blog for students to upload their experiences and thoughts about the IVSS. Starting last year, we opened it up so that students can submit projects um, in addition to English in Spanish, French, Arabic, and Croatian. And so this is great. And we saw a lot of projects using these languages last year, and it was really great to see. The only caveat is that we need judges who are able to speak these languages as well so that they can score them. So if you know anybody who speaks these languages fluently and will be interested in scoring, please send them our way. Um, we also include encourage, sorry, students to um, include an English translation if possible, just in case you don't have enough judges to score those projects that come in different languages. Finally, thank you. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us at globeivss at ucard.edu. But I would encourage you first to check out our website, globe.gov slash science dash symposium. Welcome, I'm Rusty Lowe, and I'm one of the scientists on the Globe Observer team, and I work with Globe Mosquito Habitat Mapper. This is a tool where we actually use the app, the mobile app, to identify the aqueous habitats that we find are immature mosquitoes. I'd like to introduce the Globe Mr. Mosquito team, who are all here to help you with your IVSS projects. Greetings, friends and Globe family. I am Dorian Janney, and I'm located in the Washington, D.C. suburbs in Maryland. Please feel free to reach out to me if I can help you access NASA data and help you as you're considering which types of research questions you might like to answer. Hi, everyone. My name is Cassie Soping, and I'm located in South Dakota. I'm here to help you identify potential research projects, and I work with formal and informal educators. Hi, my name is Liz Burke, and I live here in Kasilov, Alaska. My job with IGS primarily focuses on developing content for both formal and informal education products, such as the Beyond the Bite Disease Guide and our current project, the Mission Mosquito Science Notebook. To do Globe Observer, all you need to do is download the free mobile app. And when you do so, you're going to join more than 150,000 people around the world, citizen scientists, who are collecting uh, data about changes in the Earth's system. You'll be collecting data about clouds, about land cover, about trees, and about mosquitoes. If you haven't used Globe Observer before, but you know the Globe program, it's important for you to know that the tool, the Mosquito Habitat Mapper tool, is actually the GLOBE protocol. It will take you step by step through making your observation, recording your observation, documenting it with a photo, and uploading your data to the GLOBE database. When we use the Mosquito Habitat Mapper, we're trying to find those, those crazy places, sometimes cryptic places, where mosquito moms lay their eggs. Here you've got some citizen scientists here looking at an abandoned watering can. Once you get your uh, that observation, you also have the option, if you want, to take a sample and actually identify the mosquitoes. And if you want to do that, we have an in-app key that you can use. But this is optional. If you do this, you need to have a couple extra uh, pieces of equipment, a very inexpensive clip-on microscope for your mobile device, some toothpicks, and a plate is really all you need. You may not be wanting to go out and roam around and collect mosquito sites right now in this climate. But students in, or in classrooms can actually do a project by staying close. They can build a trap using a two liter pop bottle, um, just using materials that they have at home, uh, take that trap that they make, put it outside their door, and you suddenly have a group class project that everybody can participate in without coming together. What, what's important to, for us to communicate today is that there's a change this year for IVSS, which is accommodating the current conditions, and you can actually can, uh, put in a uh, IVSS project that's just using data this year. You don't have to collect data. And so I'm wanting to offer to you the opportunity to use the Globe Mosquito Habitat Mapper data. We have about 
Uh, here, there's about 24,000. We have now about 26,000 observations around the world. You can see that we have some hot spots. All these hot spots are ripe for analysis. And there's a lot of different questions that you can ask. And I've put just a few of them here. I'm sure you can think of many more. Uh, I just wanted to show you what you can do with the deep dive. I, what I did is I went to advanced data access tool on globe.gov. Uh, you can find that in the data section of the globe program website. And what I did was I collected data uh, and brought it and brought it into a spreadsheet. I looked at a specific place, Dakar, Senegal, and tried to see if there were any patterns. And sure enough, you know, I'm seeing that, you know, the different kinds of water sources that citizen scientists have identified um, vary widely. And there is something to be said there that we can maybe look at and look at patterns and try to see what we're, we're seeing. We also see that there is also an unequal distribution of the different genera of mosquitoes that were found. So maybe there's a pattern between the places that they're finding mosquitoes and the kinds that they're finding. There's all kinds of different kinds of questions. So download the data, look at it, look at patterns, form hypotheses, and then the next step is you want to compare your mosquito habitat mapper data with other sor da sources of data. You could use NASA satellite data, you could use globe data, you could even use globe observer data, and for mosquitoes, you might even be able to use uh, mosquito data that's been collected locally in that region or even disease data that's reported from that area. So I wanted to point out that on the GLOBE site, there is something called the GLOBE Mosquito Protocol Bundle. This was put together by the uh, Science Working Group. And what it does is identifies all the other sources of GLOBE data that you can use to in your analysis of the mosquito habitat mapper data. I wanted to just point out, most of you are familiar with the atmosphere, biosphere, hydrology, and pedosphere protocols, but also remember you can also use globe observer data in your analysis. And this is one thing that our team is trying to actually promote, is collecting coincident data using two or more of the tools on the Globe Observer app. So you'll see here that um, in this example, there's a new mosquito observation. They found, the, the citizen scientist has found a ditch, and then they are gonna prepare this data by also collecting land cover data or tree data, because this provides a context to understand where are these mosquitoes found, why are they found, how do they co-vary with, with the landscape, and then if you want to go further, you can say, how do, how do these things co-vary with respect to environmental conditions that might be obtained remotely using satellites? Um, we have something called the uh, Science Cafe. This is our scientist blog for Globe Observer. We have a bunch of students who have actually been guest scientists this summer. They're all high school students from around the country. And here are some of the cool ideas that they've had for projects. You can take a look at these and maybe come up with your own. And lastly, I wanted to point out that a area that I've been a, a, a IBSS uh, judge for many years because of my position as a member of the um, Globe uh, International Scientist Network. And I have not seen any projects so far that actually are done by students that have an interest in computer science and want to do some coding. But this summer, we had several students that were interested in uh, developing Python code, uh, creating Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and so what we did is we let them do whatever they wanted for their projects. And here are a couple examples of projects by our high school students. So if you have students that are interested in creating code, we can, we can upload it um, to, we have a library for code for Mosquito Habitat Mapper now that can be used for the analysis of data. So that's um, something I'd really like to encourage and take a look at some of these projects to see what they're like. Our team, which you met earlier, uh, we're all here to help you. We have a lot of different resources that can help uh, people who are running informal science programs or teachers working in classrooms to help prepare the students with the background that they, they, that they need to do a mosquito project. So take a look at some of these resources. And I also want to let you know that all the steps you need to do uh, any mosquito habitat observations. It's pretty straightforward. You can do it with our app, but we also have a playlist of, of um, short videos that you can use to tr um, in training, uh, training citizen scientists and training students to use the Mosquito Habitat Mapper protocol. And I wish you lots of luck in your IVSS projects. And I'm speaking for our whole team when I say we can't wait to see some projects that look at mosquitoes. Hey everyone, 
My name is Brian Campbell, and I am the lead for the Trees Around the Globe Student Research Campaign. And I'm based at the NASA Wallace Flight Facility. And I'm actually coming to you from Maryland right now. But take a look at this. There are trees all around me, okay? There are lots of trees all over our planet, but trees are not everywhere. And that's the one thing that we were gonna focus on for year three of the Trees Around the Globe Student Research Campaign, which I'll talk to you about a little more in depth in the next few minutes. First of all, the campaign focuses on tree height. Tree height along with land cover, green up, green down, and the carbon cycle. Did you know that tree height is the number one indicator of how well an ecosystem can grow trees? And do you know trees help us regulate the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere through the process of photosynthesis? Year three of the campaign is super important because we are focusing on one main thematic question and that is why are or why aren't there trees in my local environment let's talk a little bit more about the campaign the trees around the globe student research campaign just entered year three on september 1st of 2020 and we have a theme for student research why are or why aren't there trees in my local environment here we have the core campaign team i'm the lead brian campbell dorian janney across campaigns lead Peter Nelson, the co-lead and online tool and data expert, Christopher Schumann, the campaign subject matter expert and trees in the news lead, and Peter Falcon, the cross-country coordination lead. So why is tree height so important and why does NASA and the GLOBE program care? Basically, why do we have a campaign? Tree height is the most widely used indicator of an ecosystem's ability to grow trees. Tree height allows you to track the growth of trees over time. The GLOBE tree height observations can help researchers understand the gain or loss of biomass, which can inform calculations of the carbon that trees and forests either take in from or release into the atmosphere. NASA missions utilize an onboard laser system to measure the height of our planet one photon at a time. Specifically, we're talking about trees, so that's one thing that these instruments and missions can measure. So with the campaign, we like focusing on some data metrics. So for two years of the campaign, we have almost 50,000 total measurements in the three of the major protocols, tree height, land cover, and greening, which is green up, green down. The bottom line here is all of the above represents just a small amount of GLOBE data students can use for their IDSS projects. We love you to participate in this campaign because we have participants from 51 countries currently, and that's amazing amount of data coming in from all over the planet all from local environments. Year three of the campaign, we have a scaffolding structure where we broke it, break it up into quarters. So quarterly, we have these different focuses. First quarter from September 2020 through November 2020, we're gonna talk about the science. So we have scientists, researchers, and subject matter experts talking about the science of trees and vegetation, the carbon cycle, land cover, greenings. We wanna get that science up front so then students can then move into the second quarter of the campaign where we take that science and plan the student research, come up with research questions in order to answer that larger question that I mentioned earlier, why are or why aren't there trees in my local environment? And then once the data is all, uh, you know, formed into student research, it's submitted. So then we're going to focus our third quarter on this, what was submitted and students can then present, educators can present the research projects that were submitted to the IVSS. And that will be done in the form of webinars where the campaign, we have webinars every month where we'd have students and educators presenting the research that they've done over the last year. And then at the end of the year three, we're gonna have a one to two day thematic workshop where students can present what they've done in the last year or even three years of the campaign. And we will also have presentations from NASA scientists, from citizen scientists, subject matter experts, professionals in the field. So this is gonna be a great one to two day workshop. So we hope you join us for this. So guiding questions for student research is something we're really focusing on this year. We have a thematic overarching research question or a TORC. Why are or why aren't there trees in my local environment? And you'll hear me stress this question often because that is the backbone of year three of the campaign. We understand that's a big question to answer, but we've developed some example exploratory research questions, smaller questions that can be identified 
and explored through globe data, through satellite data, through uh, other ground-based data, through airborne campaign data that can help you answer this larger torque question. So what are the protocols that are part of the campaign that are so important to the research inside and outside of globe, inside and outside of NASA? We have tree height, we have land cover, we have greenings, which is green up, green down, and we have the carbon cycle. All of these different protocol measurements help us understand our local environment better. The data coming from these protocols from the students and some here from the NASA Globe Observer Citizen Science Tool, all of these help us understand what's happening locally so that we better understand the global picture of how our planet is changing, how our planet responds to change, how things are changing over time, okay? All of these are so vital. And with 51 countries participating in the campaign, okay, that's a lot of data. But the GLOW program, as you may know, there's 123 countries as part of the GLOW program. So that is a lot of data, okay, from coming in from 123 countries. So a little bit about the science and how NASA does this, how NASA looks at tree height from space. We have two things that I want to focus on here. One is a satellite called the Ice Cloud Land Elevation Satellite, which fires laser pulses at the planet using a laser altimeter system. And it measures the height of things on Earth from space, like trees. The JEDI mission, which is an instrument on board the International Space Station, the Global Ecosystem Dynamics Investigation, also uses an onboard laser altimeter system to measure the height of forest canopies. And this is, take two, both of these together and we have an amazing synoptic picture of our entire planet and the trees and the tree height and the tree canopies all over the world, okay? Couple that with the globe data coming in from students, educators, and citizen scientists, we have an amazing amount of data for research. So how do you take this data and then make it usable? How do you analyze it? How do you visualize it? And we have a lot of online tools that Peter Nelson will talk about throughout the year three, specifically Collect Earth, Google Earth Engine, and Open Altimetry. Just amazing, amazing tools to use. And we're collaborating with other campaigns like the European Phenology Campaign, Urban Heat Island Effect Service Temperature Field Campaign, and Globe Mission Mosquito. Just want to say thank you, and we look forward for you to join the campaign. You can learn more at the URL below. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Hi, my name is Kristen Weaver, and I'm the Deputy Coordinator for the Globe Observer Project based out of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. I'm going to talk to you a bit today about the Eclipse tool that we periodically release for special events, as well as the data that is available to analyze any time. The Globe Observer Eclipse tool is a temporary tool in the Go app that helps you document air temperature and clouds during an eclipse. The Eclipse tool will prompt you to take air temperature measurements every few minutes using a meteorological thermometer, as well as taking observations of sky conditions at regular intervals using the usual clouds tool. You can also pair this with other globe measurements like surface temperature, humidity, and so on. The tool is not visible in the app on a regular basis, but we add it to the list when a total solar eclipse is happening somewhere in the world. So far, that has been for the eclipse in North America in August of 2017, and in South America in July of 2019. Here are some pictures from a globe school in Argentina last year, the Colegio Fasta Via Eucaristica. You can see them taking cloud observations and using their safe viewing lenses to look at the eclipse. They collected both air temperature and surface temperature measurements, as you can see from the middle picture. The next total solar eclipse will also be visible in South America, coming up in December 2020, a bit further south than the last one. Another eclipse across North America will occur in April of 2024. So why does this matter? Well, the Earth is solar powered. The sun affects a lot of different systems on Earth, from the water cycle to the carbon cycle and more. It's interesting scientifically to think about what happens when the sun's light is blocked, even temporarily. I mean, we already know that eclipses are pretty cool astronomical events, but if you measure air and surface temperature, you can actually quantify how cool is an eclipse. If you are lucky enough to be in the path of an eclipse or to travel to one and can be a volunteer observer during the event, you will be able to observe how the eclipse changes atmospheric conditions near you and of course contribute to the GLOBE database, allowing scientists and students to study the effect of eclipses on the atmosphere. Even if you're not on the path of totality, you can still provide comparison data. 
The graph here is from a user of the app during the 2017 eclipse, clearly showing the drop in temperature during the eclipse and then the increase again afterward. But what if you aren't in the path of an eclipse? Well, the data can still be very interesting to analyze. One advantage of special events is there is often a greater concentration of data available. This was especially true for the 2017 eclipse, which passed over a lot of pretty populated areas. The map on the left shows US clouds data on the Monday before the August eclipse, and the map on the right shows the data from the day of the eclipse itself. You can see how much more data was collected on the special day. That's great for analysis. These maps show air temperature on the left and clouds on the right, all on August 21st, 2017. You can see how much data was collected. In fact, we had over 10,000 individual observers who collected over 20,000 cloud observations with over 60,000 photos and 80,000 air temperature measurements. We did not get as many data points from the South American eclipse, which you can see on these next two maps. The cloud shapes show cloud observations, the pins air temperature. The eclipse went over areas with less population, and it was also right at the end of the day, which is not the best for eclipse observing. The upcoming eclipse in December is during southern, the southern hemisphere's summer, and more in the middle of the day, so the sun will be higher in the sky during totality. That should make for much better observing, although the 2020 eclipse will actually pass a bit south of the one from 2019, as shown here, which is in an area without a big population center. Even so, you can see this example graph from a science club in Junín de los Andes, Argentina. They weren't even on the path of totality, only about 74% of maximum obscuration, but they collected interesting data nonetheless. Here, you can see a side-by-side -side comparison of the data from that club in Argentina in 2019 on the left, and on the right, data from multiple observers in Casper, Wyoming in the U.S. during the 2017 eclipse. The lines I'm highlighting now are the time of maximum eclipse. The data on the right has that nice dip showing the cooling effect of the eclipse, while the graph on the left just shows the temperature decreasing. This is at least in part because the eclipse in 2019 was near sunset, so the temperatures were dropping anyway. Whereas on the right, the eclipse in the middle of the day, the temperatures then started rising again after the eclipse was over. My point here is that it can be really rewarding to take a data set that has good data density and do some graphing and analysis on it, even if it wasn't data you collected yourself. The graphs I've shown you don't include any data I personally collected, although I did take measurements from Nebraska during the 2017 eclipse, and yet I was able to do some interesting exploration with it. Can you think of some good scientific questions to look at with eclipse data? Maybe you could compare the temperature of a normal day in a particular place with a day at the same place and same time of year but an eclipse. Or look at places with similar climates, one of which was in the path of totality, one that experienced only a partial eclipse. What about this question? How soon after the actual point of totality does the minimum temperature actually occur? I haven't even talked about the clouds data. Does a cloudier sky mean a greater or lesser effect of the eclipse on air temperature? So many questions to explore with this existing data set, especially if you look at other globe data or other sources of data. Hopefully these examples have piqued your interest about eclipse air temperature and clouds data, whether or not you will be in the path of an upcoming eclipse. Here are a few sources for additional information. The Eclipse section of the Globe Observer website has a lot more detail about how the observations were taken and a data analysis page which gives additional examples of graphs, as well as tips to download the data and links to curated data sets where you can get a pre-packaged spreadsheet with all the data for a specific eclipse and in a particular area, ready for graphing and analysis. I wrote a blog a couple of years ago with even more examples of graphs, including some different types, specifically using Eclipse data, which you can get to with that second link. And the third link is an article that describes the overall outreach efforts and broad data collection results of the 2017 Eclipse Across America as part of the, a book compilation about that event. And you might find that interesting. And of course, it's always a good idea to do background research and see what other scientists have investigated on your topic. Here are three examples of student research papers related to eclipses and submitted to the Globe International Virtual Science Symposium in past years. They are also linked on that Globe Observer Eclipse page referenced previously. You can see that two of them are in Spanish from the 2019 eclipse in South America. 
Finally, here are a couple of professional scientific papers that have been published about the data specifically from the 2017 eclipse. They may be a bit dense to read if you aren't used to that type of writing, but we'll show you how the professional researchers are looking at the data. If you can't get to any of these articles or papers mentioned, let me know and I can send you a copy. So, enjoy your data collection and research endeavors, and I hope you decide to take a look at some of the eclipse data collected by your fellow citizen scientist volunteer observers. Hello, my name is Marile Colon Robles, and I'm the project scientist for NASA Globe Clouds at NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia, USA. NASA Globe Clouds is a team that matches each possible cloud observation to data from multiple satellites. This includes geostationary satellites, Terra, Aqua, and Calypso. We also put together cloud data challenges and other projects like monitoring dust events around the world. Our NASA Globe Clouds page can help you learn more about clouds with our new Science of Clouds videos, get satellite flyover times to help you time your cloud observation to match a satellite, and new activities like the Family Clouds Challenge. We put together a new resource for you called Student Project Support. On this page, you will find project ideas that you can do using data already collected for clouds. These projects are just ideas to get you started and are not the only ideas you can come up with. Each project idea features step-by-step -step instructions and possible areas of investigation. Feel free to use the ideas presented to modify them based on your interests. You can practice making a cloud observation by using the photos taken by someone else and see if you can come up with the same answers. Study contrails or clouds created by airplanes and see if you can find them on the photos submitted with each report. Do non-persistent contrails show up in the photos or are they gone before the photo is taken? Is it hard to tell cirrus and persistent spreading contrails apart? These are some of the questions you can look at. Look at obscured and overcast skies. These terms tend com to confuse people. Obscured is when something like dust or smoke blocks the view of your sky and clouds. Overcast is when the sky is completely covered by clouds. Check through reports and see if the photos show an obscuration or an overcast sky. Last but not least, use the satellite match tables and see if the person saw clouds that the satellite was not able to see. Remember, satellites are great, but they're not perfect. They can detect clouds we cannot see, but they can also miss clouds we can see. These ideas are similar to how the NASA cloud team uses your cloud observations in science. We compare the observations to satellite data. We also compare results from computer models to your daily observations of cloud cover, or using the reports of dust and smoke from nearby fires to see these events up close. All of these research questions rely on good data. That means we need a way to review or check the data. This is what we refer to as data quality. You will notice this topic within the project ideas listed in our student su project support page. And you can help us determine the data quality for observations and even develop recommendations on how to improve data quality. A few notes about satellite matches. To find the satellite match table for any observation, go on GLOBE's VIZ system and click on the satellite match link found under measurements when you view, click on the observation. If you can safely make your own observations following all local guidelines, 
all satellite data matched to your observations will be sent through a NASA personalized email. Doesn't that sound awesome? Everyone who takes cloud observations receives this email, no matter how you submitted your reports to GLOBE. This, this means that you can use the data entry form, email, da email data entry, or the GLOBE Observer app. Teachers, if you have GLOBE student accounts for your classes, you as the teacher will receive all the satellite match emails. It takes between one to three days to get a match to multiple satellites. So always give reports for these emails a few days in order to receive them. We are always so impressed with the research projects you put together. We can't wait to see what you do this year. And as always, remember that science is better together. I'm Peter Nelson, and I'm the science lead for the Globe Observer's land cover tool. And I'm here to talk about some of the exciting science opportunities that you have this year to incorporate not only this incredibly easy to use tool in your science, but to involve your community and to start to explore what is not only around your community and around you, but how it interacts with the world around you the larger global environment. And so I want to invite you along to explore land cover in your virtual science symposium research experiences this year. And you may not realize how fundamental land cover is to everything that we do here on Earth. Whether we're thinking about the atmosphere or whether we're thinking about uh, the lakes and the water around us, or whether we're thinking about the vegetation. All of this is related to what grows where and, and why do we arrange ourselves the way that we do on planet Earth? So let's start and explore some of the tools that are available to you this year. So for me, this all begins with this globe visualization system. When I'm trying to understand and think about this map that makes up the world around us, this is, a, this is somebody's map that they made. And what's really exciting about uh, the science that we get to do is we can go in here and we can start exploring Earth from the satellite point of view. And all of a sudden, I find all these questions that come up, and I hope they come up for you, because NASA has been asking these questions about what makes up the Earth. And first, we have to get through all those clouds to start understanding what is on the surface. And so this is where land cover really comes in, because the, the, what grows on Earth means how green it is. Uh, what kind of sand there is shows us how, how, how red and how uh, gray it might be in a location, right? And so there's all kinds of interesting questions that we can start asking about the colors that we see on, on, on a satellite image like this. And so with that, NASA has a lot of interesting questions that we are, are currently getting asked. And they really come down to some fundamental ones that you can explore this year. One is, what is the land cover in your community? Are there trees? Is there buildings? Is there grass? Are there crops where you grow uh, food? Um, is there a lot of water around? What makes up the land cover in your community? This gets into the carbon cycle. It gets into uh, the resources that are available to you in the food, energy, and water cycles. And it's amazing that just by exploring these questions, you can start to uh, understand the history of your location and you can start wondering and start planning for possible future scenarios. NASA really is, has been looking for ways that they can also understand this question. Where is the land cover? Where are the trees? Where are the shrubs located? Where's the water located? And how is this changing? And how are, how are we playing a role in that as humans and the decisions that we make? So I encourage you to use your friends, your neighbors, your school, your community to use Globe Observer and this really easy to use mobile app to collect some, real, some good data. And that data is in the form of pictures to start off with. Really something that a lot of us work with. And so yeah, I want to highlight 
that here on the globe visualization system, when I look at an image like this, I don't know what's there necessarily. I, there's, sometimes there's clouds in my way. And so being able to go in and turn on and explore the land cover photos that have been collected by citizen scientists and community members, we can explore uh, different time periods of, of what the earth looked like. And so just going in and exploring these pictures, comparing and contrasting one location to another provides all kinds of interesting science questions. And this inquiry about why is there these green colors here in this location and brown colors in this location are exactly the type of questions that NASA is really interested in. And how long has it been like that? And so, you know, you can explore what other people have contributed, and this gives you a really interesting contrast. You can explore all of the different sort of tools and, and, and other data and videos that we've put together on the Globe Observer website to help you to understand the science. And there's a really nice video on there that, uh, that talks about the fires and what got me interested in this type of science. And importantly, you know, what we're talking about is Earth as a system. Land use, land cover, what is on the surface of the Earth and how is it changing is fundamental to understanding this really complex system. And so here you can explore a little bit more on some My NASA data websites. I really like this one that talks about phenomena because this is, this is the science that I do. So you can explore a little bit more about this, the cause and effect of, you know, how do we build the, the buildings that we do? Where do the trees come from that are now making up the homes that many of us live in? Where did that come from? Where are those resources uh, that provide our shelter, our food, right? These are things that we can start exploring and, and really researching. And one thing you might wonder is, well, what is the land cover of the Earth, right? NASA has been studying this for a while, and so there is a lot of data out there related to land cover because it's foundational to wildlife modeling. It's, under, it's, it's important to understand for so many different types of science. So you can explore a lot of different locations, including the Worldview site, where you can go in and you can search for all kinds of different information. But if you type in land cover, you can find this one that is global land cover. And there are some particular pieces of information. It go, only goes from 2001 to 2018. There's a certain sky, size related to this data set. But it's a great way to start exploring and understanding the world that's around us. And the key is it doesn't show up because I have to go back in time to when the data set's available. And so this one only goes up to 2018. So there's a great question. Has anything in your community changed between 2018 and now? And you can use Globe Observer to go out and you can record that data and you can make that comparison between what you're seeing on the ground and so what this map it, it might be showing you, for instance. But go out there and explore and find a lot of the other land cover maps that have been created. And you might find one in your area that might be even better than one what NASA has, has provided here because sometimes you need a local land cover map to be able to answer the questions that you're really asking and are really interested in. And so I want to wrap this up with highlighting a really important tool that, that has recently come out that allows you to access a lot of, of, of remote sensing data, including this land cover data set. And so there are, are some um, nice help tools here that allow you to understand exactly how to use the tool. But this allows you to go in and you you make uh, you have to log in because uh, of of using the NASA resources. Um, but it allows you to to access uh, a, a really rich set of of data by either submitting po point locations like the latitude and longitude where you took your globe observer location data um, or any other globe data um, or you can start to explore particular areas and, and you can ex actually extract out that data right here and so um, pay attention and and watch for some uh, 
other uh, tutorials and other lessons and other things like that going on that that I will be offering to to students to help explore this this incredible rich data set that is now available to to us through this and so I encourage you to go in and explore and find some remote sensing data that can really help you better understand the earth and all of the land cover that that is surrounding us so with that I look forward to learning more about projects that are happening in your area or being able to answer any questions that you have good luck in your research this year Hi, I'm Elena Sparrow, and I'm the Education Outreach Director at the International Arctic Research Center at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I'm also the lead of the NASA project, Arctic and Earth STEM, Integrating Globe and NASA. We want you to be engaged in our FROST2 protocol. And as you can see in these fields, you can uh, place your FROST tube in different places, whether it's steel, untilled, or in forested areas and we're going to be in alfalfa field and we are at the Fairbanks Experiment Farm. This is Christy speaking. Here we see Dr. Kenji Yoshikawa who will show us how to make and install a frost tube. You can see that there's a PVC pipe and he is going to plug the end of the pipe. He'll wear some gloves because the epoxy has to be mixed and is, is a chemical that you need to protect yourself. So you can see that he is um, mixing it very well. And then he's got this plug. Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Kenji Yoshiko. I'm a professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. So I tried to show you about how to install the frost tube. We're just pounding for the metal stick. There are two their weather shelter right here and uh, and it's important to know your local area and you have you can have a choice of different land cover and, uh, and fields for installing your uh, frost tube depending on where you are so once I hit the ground then we put the, the PVC pipe Pipe need the bottom of the cross like this. So typically the ground freezing in the winter time, like uh, eastern United States, typically 10 to 15 centimeters this much. Okay, so once I put in the PVC pipe, we need to put in the uh, clear tube for looking at the cross tube itself. Depending on where you are at, the depth of frost tube that you install would be deep or shallow. Educators and students should know their area. Local cities and towns have codes for how deep to install the pipes. This is based on historical frost depth data. Then we need to seal the both sides for no leaking. And Gas burner is great, but you can use even no windy day. So this is the depth of the height of the PVC pipe. We just marked on this. Marked for the ground surface point. In zero. Then start from here, we measure the cross depths. It's, it is important for data quality. It's important that the ground surface is marked properly because when the frost tube is pulled out to start reading the depth of freezing, then uh, if you don't have that line of where the ground surface starts, then your, your data quality won't be good. And so this is um, Kenji marking the, the surface and then the increments. Okay, let's summarize. Uh, we had installed the frost tube today. Depths of the frost tube now we know because we marked it from here. And depths of freezing. Uh, depths of the tube is uh, 102 centimeter. Okay, then 
pipe is above ground, 108 centimeter. I'm Christy Buffington, and I am the science education specialist at International Arctic Research Center, and I work with Dr. Elena Sparrow. So we know that Dr. Kenji Yoshikawa recorded some things on his whiteboard. You put down a depth below and above ground. When you do your site definition form in GLOBE, you will enter these data. You'll put the date that the frost tube was installed, the height above the ground in centimeters, and the depth below the ground in centimeters. GLOBE will automatically calculate the total length of the tube. When you actually co collect some measurements, you will do some data entry. Your frost tube data entry will need to have the time in UTC, universal time or local, and you will put the total maximum depth of freezing in centimeters. You'll also write, uh, click on whether permafrost was present, absent, or usually people don't really know, so they'll say unknown. If you're in the lower 48 or in a place where you know you do not have permafrost, be sure to click absent. Also, one thing that's so great about GLOBE is data integration. Understanding frost tube data is even more important when you can compare it to other factors that are influencing it, such as the snowpack, which is me measured through the GLOBE solid precipitation protocol, air temperature, and also sur surface temperature. These are all optional measurements that you have both on your data entry form and your uh, form on the GLOBE website. So now that you have data, what do you do with it? You can analyze that data by first seeing what last year's International Virtual Science Symposium student Chelsea Huckbody did. She actually uh, took on four different research questions for her investigation and one of them was to explore the difference between a forested site and the farm site that you saw in the footage in the video today. She saw, you can see this figure on the right, that frost depth, uh, you know, froze down below the ground surface at about the same rate in both the farm and the forested site, although the farm uh, didn't have as deep of freezing. So she collected uh, data herself, but she also entered Dr. Kenji Yoshikawa's historical data from 2007 to 2011. Hundreds and hundreds of data points that if you live in a place where you're not going to be able to install a frost tube, no worries. You can actually analyze Alaska frost tube data over several years. I'd like to introduce one of our collaborators, Dr. Elizabeth Brokowski, Assistant Research Professor at University of New Hampshire at the Earth Systems Research Center. So what protocols were we bundling? Well, of course, soil frost. Uh, this is actually a picture of our soil frost tubes. Uh, New Hampshire, our soil frost is not as deep, so our tube is only about a meter long. We have about a half meter that sticks above the ground and the other half goes below the ground. And when the material or the liquid inside freezes, this little chunk here is an ice cube and that blue liquid down below is the dye. So we know that we have about two and a half centimeters of soil frost in this tube. We also measured snowpack and then canopy green up. So with soil frost depth, our students helped install the tubes. Uh, this was happening after all the leaves fell. So we did this in about November here. Um, and then we also had them do daily to weekly measurements until the soil was completely thawed. We encourage you to join us for the frost tube campaign and get e-training on the GLOBE website. And we welcome the participation of students in the International Virtual Science Symposium especially frost tube projects wherever the soils seasonally freeze. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Angie Rizzi and I'm an outreach coordinator at NASA Langley Research Center. And I work with um, my NASA data and GLOBE. And some of what I work on is GLOBE air quality with Dr. Margaret Pippin. And Samantha Adams is a GLOBE teacher who has also helped with some of the information in this presentation. 
So in the western part of the United States in the last couple weeks, there has been quite a bit of interest in air quality because there have been so many fires and it is affecting air quality. So what I've done here is I've pulled up the globe visualization tool and I, I'm showing cloud cover observations. And I'm beginning here on September 1st and you notice there are a couple of very dark circles. And I'm gonna scroll through some days and those dark circles represent obscured skies. That's when an observer makes a cloud observation and they say that the sky was obscured by something. And when they do that, they can indicate um, what it was obscured by. So I'm going to select one of these observations and pull it up. And you can see that they did say that the sky was obscured. And it says smoke is true, meaning that they said that they saw smoke. And if we're lucky, they took pictures and we can click on the photos. And they are for the same day here, September 13th and look at these photos. So um, I think that, you know, these photos certainly do look like they could be showing smoke. And so that's a really interesting place to start a project like this. So I want to show you a couple of other really neat things that you can use the visualization tool for to help you with an air quality project. The first thing you can do is you can add another protocol um, aerosol optical thickness, you would find this under atmosphere and under aerosols, aerosol optical thickness. Um, and you can see if there happen to be any um, observations of actual AOT, which um, the higher the aerosol optical thickness, the uh, more likely there is that there's some kind of air quality issue. And I'm going to look back in August of 2018 and I'm going to step you through the 15th through the 21st. And notice here, this symbol shows me that there was an aerosol optical thickness measurement. So let's continue to go through a few days. And I'm seeing some aerosol optical thickness measurements. And now look, I've got an obscured sky right where that was. And I'm seeing that I have some measurements and I have been having some um, obscured skies. So if I were to click on this particular aerosol optical thickness, I have the history for that location and I'm seeing some very high numbers here. So um, that could be indicative that there was something going on. So since I may not have photos that go along with that, and even maybe don't have photos that go along with the cloud observations, then what could I possibly do within the Viz tool to investigate further? And what I'm going to say is if you go in here in this option with the three little dots, and you come in and you look at the NASA satellite data, you can come down here to aerosol optical depth and add this base layer. And these red and orange uh, colors are going to be indicative of some sort of very thick aerosol optical depth. And so you might be able to see that here where we have this, this number and we're having obscured skies showing up, that we also had um, high aerosol optical depth numbers in the satellite imagery. Okay, so that's another thing that you can explore. Now, I didn't pull this up for September of 2020 because this satellite imagery will lag by a few weeks, and so it may not be out there for a couple weeks for the first part of September, but it will be there soon. So if you want to take it even further and you want to integrate some data outside of GLOBE, you can go to Aerosol Watch. If you just Google aerosol watch, you should be able to find this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to, let's say, September 13th of 2020. I'm going to go over to the labels layer on the right and click labels layer so that I can see the, the names of the states. And I, um, I've got some true color images here. Uh, which is already marked under Go 16. And I'm going to go here under Veers. 
and this is great we have a couple different layers we can put here first is we can put some uh, fire dots and so you can see dots that have come up that are telling us where the fires are we can add the smoke and dust mask and so you can see where there is smoke and dust that the satellite has detected I'm going to take that off and I'm going to put AOD uh, which is another name uh, that people sometimes use instead of AOT and we can see that and if we put the smoke and the dust on with that we see that the AOD and the smoke and dust um, are agreeing and so this is something where we can select the date we can select these different layers and we can look at lots of information so if I were to pick uh, September 14th now um, and go back in and add some of those same layers the smoke and dust we see that perhaps it's in a different part of the United States on the 14th than it was on the 13th and so this would be a way to explore some uh, more information about air quality so hopefully you've gotten a few ideas of how you might get started on an air quality project this year but please don't hesitate to reach out to our team Margaret Pippin or myself, uh, we will both be happy to help you get started on a project and take it even further than this if you want. Thanks. Hi, I'm Kevin Sykowski. I'm a professor at the University of Toledo in the Department of Geography and Planning. I'm the PI for the NASA funded Globe Mission Earth Project, and I'm the lead scientist for the Urban Heat Island student research campaign that Globe puts on each year. I want to talk about the Urban Heat Island campaign and um, it'll give you some more information about what we're doing this year. All right, so I'm sharing my screen. So what is the Urban Heat Island? Well, the Urban Heat Island is the idea that urban areas with the concrete, buildings, asphalt, tends to be warmer than the rural areas around them. Uh, as our cities get larger, the Urban Heat Island tends to get bigger and more impactful. You know, so why do we care? Well, one of the reasons we care is that heat affects people's health. And during a heat wave, the urban areas are even warmer than the rural areas. So in the urban areas, people with um, you know, trouble uh, with the heat, maybe they have some kind of health condition, may find that they have problems uh, dealing with the heat and may have a bad health outcome. So I wanted to look at how the surface temperature or the, the temperature of different cover types is affected by, um, you know, on, on a given day. Now this is from my NASA data uh, story map on urban heat island. <clears throat> and you can see here, asphalt is 19 degrees Celsius, whereas concrete is 15. So the asphalt tends to be warmer than concrete, but the grass is 13 degrees Celsius. So that's even cooler than both of those. Well, if we look at the shade, those are even cooler. So the shady grass is four degrees Celsius, while the shaded concrete is eight degrees Celsius. So what do, what do we need to do the urban heat island campaign? Well, we need a, an infrared thermometer, a regular air temperature thermometer, and we can use the GLOBE uh, observer app. Now we're gonna do the urban heat island campaign during October, December, and March, and that's to get some kind of a yearly trend. Uh, next summer, teachers can do it, uh, students could do it as well, and I'm hoping that uh, citizen scientists could participate next summer, because of course the summertime is an important part of the urban heat island. So here I was today, I was uh, taking observations. Um, I want you to, uh, the students to put their arm out almost straight, point the infrared thermometer at the ground and pull the trigger, and then to lift up the uh, in instrument and then look at the value. You know, the students tend to put their arm pretty close to their bodies. So this is a way to keep it out from away from their bodies. Now, why do we care about the surface temperature? Well, the surface temperature is at the heart of the energy budget for the Earth. So the way the energy budget works is that the sun is the source of energy for the surface of the Earth. It heats the surface. That's where the surface temperature is. And then the energy is converted into either evapotranspiration, which is the evaporating of water from the surface. 
sensible heat flux is basically the temperature we feel or the energy is emitted to space um, as the electromagnetic energy, as thermal uh, infrared energy. And some energy goes into the ground. And so the surface temperature is very important. Now, when your students take observations, we want you to do it within a homogeneous area. And this would be considered one site. And we want them to take nine observations within that one site. So in this case, it's grass and this uh, ball field and in between that and the playground. Now, we don't want the students to take you know, like half grass observations, half gravel observations, or anything like that. That's not the idea of the surface temperature site. So uh, for one site, basically, the, like I was saying, the grass would be one site. You take nine observations. If you want to do the gravel of the softball field, that would be a second site, and then take nine observations of that site. Air temperature is not too hard. Use a thermometer, um, hold it away from your body, but in the shade, and then you know take take a reading, and then take wait a minute and take another reading. If it doesn't change much, then that's the value. If it's still changing, then wait another minute and take another reading, and wait until keep doing that until it doesn't change much. You can use the Cloud Observer app to do the clouds. Um, here I am doing that today. And just to show you the surface temperature observations around the world for the last five years, there's a lot of observations. So in case your students aren't able to take observations themselves this year, maybe they're doing remote learning, um, you can have the students data mine the GLOBE database. So like I said, there's a lot of data on the GLOBE website. And you could find, the students could find an urban and a rural school next to each other and maybe do a comparison. Also this year, I want to look at tree height or tree cover in general to see how that might affect the urban heat island. You know, some cities or areas have more trees than others. And it seems that, you know, trees keep things cool. So one thing you could do is your students could use the Globe Observer app to measure the tree height, but also the land cover part of the, of the Globe Observer app to look at what percentage of the ground cover is trees. And then compare that with the surface temperature. Lastly, I wanted to talk about the uh, urban heat island story map that NASA Langley put together for my NASA data. It's a really great resource. It's something you could have your students do. And um, they broke it into the 5E model using engage, explore, explain, elaborate, and evaluate. And it's a really great way to introduce the students to urban heat island. All right, here's our contact information. I really want to thank you for attending today. And I hope you do the Urban Heat Island campaign this year. Thank you for including my NASA data in this webinar to support GLOBE student investigations with NASA data. My name is Elizabeth Joyner, and I'm the Senior Outreach Coordinator and Point of Contact for my NASA data at NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. I'm proud to work with a team of educators, scientists, programmers, and more. We're all focused on the mission of providing educational communities of grades 3 through 12 access to NASA Earth Science data, as well as tools and models for data analysis. The goal of today's session is to introduce you to MyNASA Data's Earth System Data Explorer, a data visualization tool. I will demonstrate to you how you can identify and explore NASA data related to student GLOBE campaigns and projects. I'll also model how to use the Earth System Data Explorer to access these NASA data in a variety of formats for further analysis. I will also provide resources to support research as well as how to connect with my NASA data when questions arise about these data on our data visualization tool. The My NASA Data team is excited to support students' research practices of analyzing and interpreting data. Our resources are uniquely poised to help students address all three themes for the IVSS in 2021, including the importance of exploring your local and regional areas, integrating a variety of data types to better address research questions, as well as addressing the need to use high-quality data in research.
As researchers move from individually collected data to larger data sets, MyNASA Data provides access to professionally collected data through our data visualization tool known as the Earth System Data Explorer. No matter if you're using the Globe Observer app, individual protocols, or participating in Globe campaigns, MyNASA Data's Earth System Data Explorer provides NASA Earth Science data in daily, monthly, and or yearly formats, depending upon the science variable of interest. MyNASA Data affords the opportunity to integrate a variety of data in the pursuit of science. We are proud to offer students and teachers a variety of data to choose from, depending upon the scientific area of interest. Provided here are the numbers of supporting data sets for each of the campaigns or apps. Researchers may ask, why would I wish to use NASA data sets rather than focusing solely on GLOBE data? The answer is clear and includes, but not limited to, the following rationale. When researchers compare GLOBE data to NASA and other agency professionally collected data, they are afforded opportunities to identify a baseline to compare their GLOBE data to. They may also identify how closely aligned their observations are to NASA sensors. In these ways, the researcher may use NASA data to promote their data quality efforts. Also, including these data in your GLOBE research offers the opportunity to explore relationships among science variables for a particular location or region. This supports the researcher's efforts of data integration. Additionally, the data sets offered in the Earth System Data Explorer provide researchers opportunities to analyze and interpret similar variables for a given region or location to better characterize patterns or trends. Okay. So have I convinced you that integrating NASA data in your GLOBE research is a good idea? Great. Let me highlight for you how to get started. On the MyNASA Data website, information is generally divided into spheres of the Earth system. That is atmosphere, biosphere, cryosphere, geosphere, which is part of the petosphere, hydrosphere, and the Earth as a system. Each of these spheres offers links that are of particular interest to our GLOBE community members like you. Click on each sphere, find the GLOBE Connections link in the drop-down menu, and then open one of the resulting pages entitled Protocols and Related Earth System Data Explorer, or ESDE for short, datasets for that sphere. On this page, you will find access to a Google Sheet that provides suggested data sets that support investigations using different protocol. If you need ideas for research opportunities, explore further down the page. This is a snapshot of the different offerings of this Google Sheet for each sphere. Notice at the top for atmosphere in blue. The GLOBE protocol shown here is for aerosols. The Earth System Data Explorer provides a variety of related NASA data sets such as daily aerosol optical depth, as well as daily cloud coverage, and many more. This resource that connects protocols to NASA data is provided for each sphere. My NASA data also has recommended data sets that support research projects that incorporate GLOBE protocol bundles. This resource is provided under the Earth as a System at the top of the main page next to the other spheres. Now I want to model for you how to access the Earth System Data Explorer. This is a web-based application that doesn't require any special download. You just need to type the URL shown here. In the next steps, I will show you how to locate data sets, create create mapped images and line plots, as well as show how to export the data to use in a spreadsheet for further analysis. Once the Earth System Data Explorer is loaded, you will be prompted to select a data set. To do this, you will need to select the sphere of the Earth System of interest shown here in number one. These data are organized by all data or featured phenomena. I recommend browsing the data sets found in the All Data list. They are provided in alphabetical order, as shown here in number two. Also, once you've clicked on the data set of interest, select Update Plot to load these data, 
shown here in number three. Now you should see a mapped image of your data set. You may verify this by ensuring that the radial button for the latitude longitude under maps is selected as shown on number one. You may select a particular time of interest by selecting the year, month, and or date at number two. Don't forget to update plot at number three to load your data or select the checkbox next to update plot and this will automatically update the data for you. Next, we will use the Earth System Data Explorer to generate a line graph that shows changes of a particular science variable over time at a given latitude and longitude. First, we will select the line plot radial button. We will select time if we wish to create line graphs of our data. See number one. Next, we will enter an area of interest using latitude and longitude and decimal degrees shown at number two. Then we will enter the start and end times that we're interested in visualizing, see number three. Finally, we will update plot at number four. Finally, the user can export the data into commonly used data formats for use with Excel, Google Sheets, etc. Number one, to do this, first select the Save As button. Next, under Select a Data Format, select CSV, Data File Format, also known as Comma Separated Values. Save your file into your preferred location on your computer and import these into your spreadsheet applications. Voila! Now you have your own NASA data file to use for data analysis, just like NASA subject matter experts. In case you likely missed a step, have no fear. My NASA data has a variety of tutorials and guides to help you use this incredible tool. Don't miss our My NASA Data YouTube channel and the step-by-step -step tutorial guides to do these tasks and others, like creating your own animations of NASA data. Additionally, the My NASA Data team is always here to help. Feel free to reach out to me or my teammates using the Contact Us link on our website. It has been a real pleasure presenting this incredible tool to you to help facilitate your GLOBE research projects. Best of luck this year. All I can say is, wow, that was pretty amazing. Thank you all so much for sharing everything that you've done today. Um, I know that all the panelists are still here. And if you have any questions that you would like to ask specifically, they are here. And so um, you can type them in the chat. If you're looking for a particular URL, they've been updating the chat. Kind of have to scroll back or up to see perhaps what you were looking for, but um, our video will be shared on our uh, YouTube channel and our um, Globe Mission Mosquito webpage, so you can see the archive. And uh, I'll stop talking and let you ask questions. I see ya. Marta, I've unmute or given you talking permission. If you'd like to unmute, you're welcome to ask your question aloud. In the meantime, Tracy asked, um, with your programs, what implementation tips would you suggest? Can you hear me? Yes, Marta, we can. Okay, okay, thank you. How are you? Um, here in uh, Argentina, we are locked down and the schools are closed from March. And uh, we suppose that this year um, we are not uh, coming back to school. 
and uh, we have a lot of our all our instruments at school. For that, uh, my question uh, is, um, and I wrote in the chat, if it is possible to use uh, uh, some app to measure temperature and compare with the uh, digital stations, meteorology, meteorological digital, digital stations that are near our neighbor, because some of the students are working from in, in her or his houses, and it is, it is a difficult situation, no? And I think Marta um, and Kevin or, or Peter even might have additional answers. I think a lot of the times when you look up a temperature on your phone, it's actually pulling from those local stations nearby. So it's not getting the temperature at your actual location, but where, wherever the nearest weather station is. Um, there are temperature sensors in many devices, but I think they're primarily used for the, determining if the phone is overheating. Um, and I don't know that they, I don't know if you can get access to them otherwise, and I don't know that they would be very accurate. So unfortunately, I'm not sure there's a good solution. Peter, you have an infrared camera, I know, right? But those are kind of pricey. Um, so that may not actually be a very good solution either. Yeah, I think, you know, Marta, what you're talking about is a challenge that a lot of people have had is what happens if you don't have an instrument to go out and collect data. So one of the things that we're doing in the Trees Around the Globe campaign is we are focusing on how scientists uh, might look at a satellite image or the data like uh, temperature data um, without being able to go there. Uh, this is kind of the the wonderful thing about remote sensing science is there's a lot of techniques that allow us to do image interpretation or to uh, make graphs of uh, temperature over time, other things like that that uh, overcome some of the challenges of being able to uh, visit a location safely, whether it be a volcano that's exploding or a wildfire or, um, or uh, something like COVID that is causing um, some disruptions like that. So uh, I encourage you to, to reach out to some of the project leads uh, and campaign leads here um, to, to uh, so that they can help you find some remote sensing uh, uh, techniques or, or lessons that might be able to help you do that comparison between um, a digital station that's collecting that temperature data and then some of the satellites that are that are taking measurements of the surface um, uh, on a lot more widespread area. So there's, there's, that's kind of the exciting thing is there's a lot of tools. We've overwhelmed you with a lot of these. Um, and so, so um, you know, take some time to think about some of your own situations, what students might be able to do this year. Um, and, and we have a lot of solutions to help you overcome those particular situations that you might have. Okay, thank you so much. One other thought before we move on to the next one, because when we were preparing for the 2017 eclipse, I, I, found, I found a bunch of different types of thermometers that I had, some of which were actual meteorological thermometers, but I think I also tested some like meat thermometers and things like that that are not necessarily supposed to be for air temperature. Um, and they, they, they were actually, some of them were, were actually in a reasonable range. I think they're still not the best and you might not be able to report the data through GLOBE for if, if they're not quite the right type of thermometer. But you might think about that if it, as, as another point of comparison is that um, some things that I don't know that like thermometers for measuring a fever would work, or would work but there, there might actually, you might have around or your students might have around some thermometers that you could try and see if they match to the, the local weather station numbers. An interesting investigation, if nothing else. And I would throw out one other thing, and that is that, you know, this is a really good time to start trying some new things. And there are so many data sources that are available, you know, in, in other locations through GLOBE with people that perhaps have automated weather stations or, you know, are collecting that data at home. And then by looking at, you know, the online satellite data sources. So, you know, that might be something you consider as well, just uh, how you might modify what you've been doing before and um, try something else out. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. And um, 
Marta, I think. Hello. Yep. Hi, hello, hello to everyone. Seeing hello. your faces, I'm so happy to see you again, all of you. Uh, you know, I was thinking what to do with our students and you just gave me a big banquet of many ideas. I don't know where to start, but we are going to start, you know, this is the moment, the perfect moment because we are preparing the National Science Fair. So this is great. Uh, and, and all the ideas you gave are excellent. For example, Rusty, I, you know, we were thinking how to collect data for mosquito data and that mosquito but, wow, excellent. Also, um, to my friend in Argentina, you know, you can use the weather stations that private uh, companies or private homes have near where you are taking your observations because that's what we use. And for urban heat, I believe that's what we are going to do to analyze different weather stations from universities, private companies and stuff. So. Thank you very much, and you will hear from Dominican Republic very soon. Bye. Thank you. All right. Thank you all very much for attending and staying, and thank you all presenters for sharing your wonderful resources and your presentations today. Um, those of you attending who would like to see the archive, check out Globe Mission Mosquito in the next couple of days. We should have our archive up there for you. Thank you all again very much. <laughs>